Hey everyone, it's Sean Carey with Migration Productions, back again with our Exploring the Natural World YouTube series. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, today is the final video in our three-part series for my documentary, A Wing and a Care, where we help tell the stories of three individuals and the birds they've been working to protect. I'm particularly excited today to introduce you to Tom Sayers and his Northeast Connecticut Kestrel Box program. Uh, Tom is a personal friend and someone I admire very much uh, plus, I've spent time with him in the field photographing birds at many locations. I always enjoy spending time with Tom, and everybody I know thinks very highly of him. You know, he's a man of few words, uh, he's humble, and he's compassionate beyond words. Uh, everybody knows the old expression, uh, he'd give you the shirt off his back. Well, that, my friends, is Tom Sayers. Tom has demonstrated very clearly what one person can do for bird conservation when they devote the time and energy to see a project through each and every year. You know, Tom started his Kestrel Box program from the ground up and for over 10 years now has banded and fledged an amazing 1,067 American Kestrels. Just think about that number for one minute. 1,067 Kestrels fledged in 10 years. You know, last year alone he fledged 138 Kestrels and the highest number for a season is 182. Folks, I think we need a few more people like Tom Sayers. If we did, I believe the world would be a much better place. And I'm sure you know someone just like my friend Tom, and you're a better person for knowing that individual. If you enjoy this video, I encourage you to hit the like button and subscribe so you don't miss any future videos here on Exploring the Natural World. I'll leave the link below for Tom's website and please leave a comment or a suggestion for a future topic or a guest you think others might be interested here on our channel. Now let's see and hear the story of my friend Tom Sayers and his Northeast Connecticut Kestrel Box program. The American Kestrel moves like feathered lightning. Though not as fast as its larger cousin, the Peregrine Falcon, a Kestrel can sustain a flight speed of nearly 40 miles an hour and reach a fleet 60 miles an hour in a dive. Even more impressive is its maneuverability. Kestrels can catch warblers on the wing and grab hummingbirds out of the air. This is a fast, agile bird. For kestrels in the eastern United States, perhaps the only thing in their habitat that's faster is the rate at which they're disappearing. America's eastern grasslands are under direct assault, falling to the plow, or the constant press of human development. And the American kestrel has fallen with them. For the last two decades, this little falcon, once abundant throughout the East, has been in sharp decline. Enter Tom Sayers, retired school teacher, bird lover, and keen observer of the natural world. Deeply involved with his local Connecticut birding community, Sayers saw the warning signs and took action in 2010, he began a groundbreaking program to establish and monitor kestrel nesting boxes, banding each year's new birds, work that he continues today. Over the course of eight seasons, he's banded 955 fledgling kestrels and 219 adults for a total of 1,174, collecting valuable data and shining a light on the habits and health of this magnificent falcon. Hi, uh, I'm Tom Sayers from Tallinn, Connecticut. Professionally, I taught special education in Tallinn for 35 years. Uh, retired four years ago, and that sort of released me to follow some of my other passions, one of them being the natural world, and especially these kestrels, actually. I think it's also significant to point out that um, I'm a retired school teacher. I, I don't have any degrees in biology, ornithology. I am not an employee of the state of Connecticut, DEP. Uh, I'm not sponsored or in any way officially connected to any Audubon societies. Simply to make the point that I'm a citizen. This is citizen science. I'm just a guy with a passion and a vehicle and a ladder. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. And I think it's really important to encourage people out there that Start slow, but but don't don't not take it on because you don't have a degree or or, or you you know you, whatever. If you have the passion, then the rest will happen. So I put up five boxes the first year, 
and I actually had two boxes that had birds. I was amazed, and from then you just sort of, you know, you're, you're sort of hooked. The first year you have two boxes, successful out of five, where does it go from there? Initially I thought, more boxes. <laughs> so I started putting up 17, 18, 20, 25, but I wasn't having much more success with occup occupancy in the boxes. I had to start looking at, obviously something's not right here, and it was probably the habitat, which it was. Just because you have wide open spaces it doesn't equal Kestrel success. There's a lot of other factors that go into it. I call it these micro habitats within the bigger picture. Find open spaces with areas with scruffy, unmowed, either swales in the middle or edges or fence lines or something. They like medium to high stuff uh, that isn't cultivated. And the worst thing are these huge monoculture hay fields, timothy fields. That's actually not kestrel habitat. Now, the fringes of it might be, so it's not a reason not to put a box there. But if there's no fringes, no scruffy, if it's well maintained, if it's manicured, I call it, I, I don't even bother anymore. And that, that, that's, that's the one thing I look for is, is this stuff that's behind me. That's, that's the key. And it doesn't have to be a lot. Three or four acres of that is enough. You know, so you don't need 40, 50 acre fields. Christmas tree farms and nursery stock are great. They have rows between them that aren't mowed much. So you get this beautiful foot high grass. They have tons of perching spots. Kestrels love to be perched up. Not high, but they like to be up four, five, six feet. So you have perching and unmowed areas in these Christmas tree farms and these nursery farms which makes them probably the, almost the single best habitat I've got. The orientation of the box is important. It should be facing east or west. I learned you have to manage these boxes intensely. You have to go in those boxes a lot, mostly for starlings. You have to eliminate starlings from these boxes. So you have to be able to get in and out of these boxes four, five, six, seven, eight times a week. And starlings will outcompete kestrels. Kestrels will not use a box if starlings are, are in there. Now I've got about, about 80 boxes up. It, it, there's an ebb and flow. I don't leave them all up if they're not working. Three years, it comes down. No matter how much in love I am with that piece of habitat, if, if there's not a kestrel in three years, that box is gone. Females and the males have adopted a certain box. They are then missing in action for a while. When egg laying starts, she spends most of her time in the box. The, the male is nowhere to be seen during most of egg laying incubation. From the time the first egg is laid, it's 30 days, give or take a day, to hatching. And then after hatching, it's 30 days, give or take a day, to fledging. So it's 30 days to hatch, 30 days to fledge. And during the time when they're developing, it's mostly the female probably, probably delivers 90% of the prey or more. The male will, it's typically larger prey when he shows up, whether it be meadow voles or small birds or whatever. Once the eggs start hatching, then they will obviously start feeding multiple, multiple box visits. And I have seen them quite a few times do transfers where the female's in the box. She knows the male's coming. I don't know how she knows that. The male will land on the box with something. She jumps out, grabs the prey, goes inside. Prey, typically with the young birds, the very young birds, is mostly insect-based. Uh, not completely, but early on it is. They tend to go for the uh, larger insects, which I guess would make sense. You don't want to expend too much energy to get not enough return. Dragonflies are very popular, so to speak. Crickets and, and grasshoppers, the larger grasshoppers, those are the three main insects, as you'll see. Later, as they get older, it seems to be larger prey, small mammals, small birds. It's mostly meadow voles that, that you would see. And then with birds, a house sparrow is about as large as it's going to get. Percentage-wise, varies by the time of the year, and it varies also by whether they're feeding young or not. If they're just feeding themselves, they seem to actually gravitate towards even larger prey. When they're feeding the young, they seem to like the smaller stuff, not always, that they just drop in the box and run. 
drop it and run, drop it and run. They'll bring the larger prey, tear it up, feed it, dis disperse it out, but depends on the time of the year and what's going on. And the female will, you know, feed the birds which you expect individually. Interestingly enough, she doesn't do that early on. Whoever's the biggest, baddest five-day-old chick is the one that grabs the dragonfly and spends the next 20 minutes trying to gag it down. <laughs> and then when the birds fledge, they stay as a family group in the same area for three or four weeks. The first thing the birds do when they fledge, I notice this time and time again, they go for the nearest tree line, they get in the canopy, and they're there. They don't move, literally hardly move for four, five, or six, seven days because they are very, very vulnerable at that point. So the family group hangs out for two or three weeks. They're still dependent on the adults for feeding. They start to hunt and pool around and eventually they figure it out. Farmers and landowners, they, they like the fact that you're just a citizen trying to make a difference. They worry about people with a little more authority and are they gonna start directing how they should manage their property or that kind of thing. So that's the other part of it, you're just sort of a regular guy and they, they, they like that. Why did I start here? Well, the habitat. But the other reason I started here was that this was one of the few areas that I knew of where anecdotally there was reports occasionally of kestrels. But the people who bird this area well, right before I started say that in my 80 square mile area, there might have been there might have been two or three kestrels, maybe. You know, it was rare, rare to see a kestrel. The whole issue with kestrels is you hear about habitat, habitat, habitat. There actually is still a lot of really nice habitat in Connecticut and Massachusetts and Rhode Island begging for kestrel boxes because I think we can see from my work that the limiting factor, even though you can talk about West Nile and Cooper's hawks and pesticides, I feel the limiting factor is nest box availability because why would you go from three or four kestrels to hundreds, you know, uh, just it's because of the nest boxes and the management. Further became my interest in the science behind it, the population dynamics. Who's sitting on that box next March? Same bird, a young bird from that box, a young bird from another box, you know. So then you get into color banding, federal banding, telemetry. Uh, this year we put 15 geolocators out on birds. So trying to understand the population dynamics because you're trying to not just look at these birds because they're cool, you're trying to figure out how to make the population grow. And you can't do that without getting answers to questions like that. All of that has been a, a, a learning curve and all important if you want to try and manage the species and not just hope for the best. The thing that I've been really watching, the data I've been watching, is how many nest boxes over time are the kestrels using without Tom having to manage the starlings? In other words, if, if, if my only role is to eliminate starlings so the kestrels can come in, it, when I leave or when I stop doing this, the, ke the, the starlings win. You know? So what I'm watching is how many boxes, and thankfully over time that number is increasing. It, it, it's on an upward trajectory. I think this past season, this current season, I think there were 21 boxes that were accepted by kestrels without me doing basically anything with starlings. Back three years ago, that number was only 12. So that's our hope, is that you build this critical mass of birds, which then will be self-perpetuating and take it over. That's, that's, that's the hope. There's a lot of habitat still in Connecticut wanting boxes. I can't do any more than I'm doing now basically out of my area. What do you do about that? Well, the state this year has been working with me. We did a couple articles in the state wildlife magazine soliciting what we call kestrel nest box stewards. Citizens like me who are interested, who know of a piece of property or whatever, who maybe want to adopt or monitor a box or two. They don't have to go crazy like Tom Sayers and do 80, just one or two. And we actually had a pretty good response. We had five people who were very serious about it. I visited the site, I assessed it, good property, good habitat, put up a box, explained what they had to do, and it was, a, it was a start. So they're in place, these people are committed, they know what they have to do, they'll get better at it just like I did. Hopefully over time you start 
building that network of Kestrel Nest Box stewards throughout Connecticut, and that's how you can grow it without me trying to do more and without expecting them to do what I'm doing. You can't expect that. So that's the, that's the hope and that's the plan for the, the future. I hope after seeing this video of Tom, you're truly inspired by his compelling story and the great work he's done on behalf of the American Kestrel. After this third video for this series of people uh, that we've highlighted, I may sound like a broken record, but once again, I want to urge you to please get involved, find that one bird, the mammal, or other species that speaks to you in a way that makes you want to be a Tom Sayers, a Norman Smith, or even a Dr. Stephen Kress. Do not underestimate your ability to make a real difference in helping to promote good conservation in your hometown, state, nationally, or even internationally. That's all for now, but please check out some of our past videos. And as always, remember, help protect wildlife and help protect wild places. Cheers.